thank you for being here. Um, You're welcome. Oh. <laughs> not you, Dave. I'd actually like to ask at the beginning, like what got you into music and what, what was your start with, with music? And then we'll eventually go to the, the They Might Be Giants part of it all. Okay, well, my start with music was um, my dad, who was a music lover, genius level. You could whistle him 10 seconds of any tune, anything that happened before like 1955, and he would know what it was. So I grew up on classical music. I, I took classical piano from the age of five, and my parents wouldn't let me improvise. They said, no, 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 that is not good. You do not, you play what the teacher tells you to play. And, um, and so I was like, okay, so I, I never really learned to improvise. I was born in Romania, so, and I came here when I was four years old. We moved to Massachusetts. So I always had a really European classical take on music. And then when I was about 11 years old, my dad thought, she should really get to know pop, popular music in America. And so he got me this record with like uh, Aretha Franklin's Chain of Fools and like Soul Man and, and the, the hits from that age. And, and it kind of blew my mind. And then Tom Lehrer and then progressive rock uh, and avant-garde music and all that kind of stuff. So your album that we, I've been listening to all week is making more and more sense with the, yeah, as yeah, you totally. like say that. <laughs> That's so interesting. I wish my parents had an accent so that when I like <laughs> imitated them, I could have like a cool accent. <laughs> they just sound like me, but like a deeper voice. Actually, when did you start like writing your own songs? A few false starts in late high school. And then in college, I majored in music. Uh, I went to University of California, San Diego, which had like the avant-garde music department, which meant that, you know, the only useful thing that I really learned from that school was how to coil a mic cable. <laughs> ah, <laughs> I learned that too. <laughs> it's a good one. And then when I got together with my husband, Brian Woodbury, we started writing songs together. Mm -hmm. I started out thinking, I'm a composer, not a songwriter. And the songwriting thing was really influenced by Brian more than anything. And were you singing at all during this time or were you mostly working on piano? I was singing in like high school choir, college mm -hmm. choir. So not really trained as a, as a solo singer in any way. I lived in France in 1977, college a broad year and I went to London for Christmas and it was like the height of the whole punk mm -hmm. rock thing and I just got totally into the whole punk rock scene. I saw Susie and the <laughs> Banshees and a whole oh, bunch wow. of other bands and it was really fun and and that made me get that gave me the freedom to go, hey maybe I can sing. Maybe right. I can I don't have to be good at it. I don't have to know what I'm doing. And so back in San Diego, I joined some punk bands. and then, But then I met Brian, and it got much better. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember some of the names of those punk bands? Because this is a reoccurring thing on our show, is people just have great names <laughs> for these bands they were in. I just remember that we, we rehearsed in a storage unit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've rehearsed there. I I thought you looked familiar. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny cuz me and Dave were both we're basically just fans of all the music from that time, but we were born <laughs> we were born after that time, so it's just this endless like it's kind of Lamenting. because but yeah, we could never experience it, so it's like this fa endless fascination. Like it, it never gets We missed all the good CBGB band era yeah. bands. Yeah. And we you know, both played at CBGBs, right. but like in the <laughs> 2000s when it was not yeah, really. we played at CBGB's too. It's like they gave they gave us a slot at like one in the morning, and, and we were we were like in our late twenties, and we're we're too old for this now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, wow. See, I feel like like I can almost just talk about like random old punk bands from the seventies. But um, <laughs> so okay. And by the way, I did listen to a lot of Brian's music and the music that you linked me to, and I, I liked so I liked a lot of it so much. 
it reminded me a lot of this kind of like was t- a little TMBG ish, a little like mix of a few things that uh, different bands that I like, almost a touch of like Weird Al. And I, I hesitate to say it because when people say that about my music, I get upset. <laughs> but it, no, I, no, we we love Weird Al. In fact, Weird yeah. Al's guitar player. Um, Jim Kimo West plays Jim with West. Brian. Oh my God. Oh, that's right. He just won a Grammy, didn't he? He just won a Grammy and he's yeah. such a lovely person. Beautiful, wow. beautiful music. And and playing this serene new agey stuff. <laughs> and, and then he also plays with Weird Al. So. so what's the steps now? Singing the fingertips, which is you're with Brian, you're doing music, you're starting to write songs, you're starting to sing. How did you end up in, I guess it's the magic shop, right? Where, where they recorded Apollo 18. Brian and I started off in San Diego, and our band, Some Philharmonic, was there. Then we moved to Mm. Oakland and performed there. Then we moved to L.A. and eventually moved to New York. And Brian's sister, Heather Woodbury, who's an amazing playwright, performance artist, performance novelist, um, knew they might be giants. And she kept telling us, you guys would love them. You sound just (laughs) like them. And... um, (laughs) Brian's cousin, Jenny Williams, was, uh, I think, roommates with Linnell, or both of them. I can't remember where or when. It's all (laughs) very hazy. We understand it was a long time ago. We went to a dinner party at Jenny's house, and John and John were there. And, you know, they were like, I I thought you guys should meet for for years you you guys will love each other and we we hit it off and and hung out and we all lived in Williamsburg for a while that's how we met them and hung out in our in our wild youth before Williamsburg was what it is now <laughs> yeah. whatever that is and were you playing shows with them with your band or was it two separate lives I don't think we ever played shows together. I think Brian played on something of theirs. They went to like WFMU and did something and Brian played on something, but I, I can't remember. You saw their shows live at the time, like in the yeah, 80s? Yeah, we and saw, the... uh, I remember seeing them at Dorinka. Oh mm-hmm. my God. Yeah, I remember uh, going to, you know, a bunch of their shows and oh, there was one show where Flansburg got really annoyed with us because we were in the front, just totally digging the music and bouncing up and down, except it was horrendously loud. So Brian and I were both plugging our ears, (laughs) dancing wildly, plugging our ears in order to not, you know, to not get complete hearing loss because it was that loud. And Flansburg later was like, you guys, I can't believe you plugged your ears right in front of us the whole time. That, that was very disconcerting. And we were like, oh, sorry, yeah. I didn't realize <laughs> that that might create a weird feedback loop. Yes, we are loving it, but it is painfully loud. That's happened to me. I saw a band at the South Street Seaport in New York, and wow. I don't know what was going on, but it was. I've never felt such physical pain in my ears in my entire life. And I was doing that the whole show. And it really ruined it because it was a yeah. great show. I could tell it was a great show. See, I actually asked people after my show, I was like, oh, it must have been really loud. And they were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I do remember is going over to, I guess it was Flansburg's apartment. And he had to go, we were on our way somewhere and he had to go change the tape for the, whatchamacallit, the... Um, dial dial a song thank you yeah he had to go like change it and and i remember like (laughs) having to step over just a a bunch of detritus on the floor trying to get to the the little phone machine thing where (laughs) where he went to change the tape and i thought it was quite amusing there was an equal amount of stuff on the floor as on (laughs) the surfaces of things so that changed. I think that changed later, but <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel better about my apartment. That's right. <laughs> what are the steps from going from knowing them uh, casually to getting asked to be on an official album and being part of a song? I just remember them saying, "Hey, you want to sing a couple of these short little songs?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure." And so I can't even remember if they gave them to me 
in advance or if I just learned them in the studio. The main memory that I have is, um, let's see, I sang on two of them. Hey Now Everybody. Hey Now Everybody uh, is like, that's definitely one of the more uh, in your face. Yeah, it's rocking. <laughs> fingertips. Hey Now Everybody, now Hey Now Everybody. And something, you know, regarding your vocals is it's like a lot of harmonies, right? I can't quite tell how many of you there are, but it just sounds like a, several of you. Do you remember, were you told what harmonies to do? Were you, do you remember like making it up? I remember rocking out in the booth <laughs> and just wanting it to go on. And I mm. now vaguely remember singing harmonies. Yeah. Which I think I learned right then and there. I may be wrong about that. So, well, so John Linnell wrote the song. He wrote all the, the little songs, yeah. or if you want to call it one song. So what, what I would suspect is that he, he had some sort of elaborate demo f at first and that he maybe had planned out the harmonies or, what, or whatever. But I also d I did wonder if just because just of your vocal style and everything, if he just was like, oh, just do it a few times and see what happens kind of thing. No, but. it wasn't do it a few times and see what happens. He didn't ask me to make up mm. the harmony. I was given the harmony because I would have freaked out if I had had to make up harmony on the spot. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it's a great it's a great uh, part of the fingertips because it's well, it's just it's just kind of shocking hearing a different voice when you've listened to a whole album of, right. of their just right. mainly just their voice and stuff. And I think with the with the next one, which is track twenty five, it's please pass the milk, please. The classic. Please pass the milk, please. Please pass the milk, please. Please pass the milk, please. Just on a, a personal note, um, after listening to so much of your music, it, it almost seems like he was intentionally going for your sound and your style. It's almost like a weird parody of a lot of what your album sounds like in a way. It's a bouncy, you know, keyboardy sound and like, you know... I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that was what he was going for, why he, they picked you. Did you have any sense of why you for, for these mm. or for Zero that one? Zero sense of why me. Zero <laughs> sense. I mean, the, the only thing that I could think of is that maybe because it's sort of a chromatic melody, it sounds mm -hmm. like a normal melody, but it's warped. Mm -hmm. The chords that the melody outlines aren't totally normal, and it just feels like... Maybe he thought I could do it because, you know, I don't know why. Yeah. You'll have to ask him. <laughs> yeah. Did you have any inclination of what any of the lyrics meant or was that kept close to the vest? Like, in other words, why please pass the milk? It's one of the weirder. It's one of the more specific <laughs> fingertips because the others yeah. are a little more general, like leave me alone or they're right. a little more like I statements. And then please pass the milk. It's like you're actually visual. You get a you get a little movie in your head. Uh, you yeah, know. <laughs> that's what I got too. And and I I don't think it the movie was supplied to me. I just imagined <laughs> right. sort of a, a you know 1950s Jetsons family right. around a table. Mm -hmm. You know <laughs> when people had manners. When people had manners, <laughs> that's right? Exactly. They said please and thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. You think there's like a temptation to ask them why, or just, mm. or were you just so into the? I think about this a lot too. Like you're all in these kind of artsy new wave, you know, whatever you want to call it, bands, and then you it's kind of like a don't question it kind of thing, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's, a, there's a don't question it kind of thing. And, I mean, that little snippet is obviously hilarious because you repeat mm -hmm. the word please at the end of the phrase for no good reason. It does seem a little childlike, like maybe it's a, a kid asking his mom for milk kind of thing. I mean, Trying to be so, so good and polite. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's the funny <laughs> thing about the song. So, no, yeah. I never asked, what is this about? What is my motivation right. here, John? Just mm. give me something. <laughs> you know, I, I just sang it. And, and there was, and in the studio, there was not a lot of time for explanation uh, yeah. because mm -hmm. the clock was ticking. The dollars were spinning, you know, right. so. <laughs> Which leads yeah, me true. to an uh, <laughs> anecdote that I remember during the recording of that song, I wanted to get it really in tune and really perfect. And I, and I, mm -hmm. I did like two or three takes and I thought, oh, I've almost got it. If I could do it like 
five more times, I'm sure I could get it. And Flansburg was like, nope, that's it. You've got it. No, <laughs> wow. hurry up. Come on. And, and it was like <laughs> business-like. Come on. This is not, this is not uh, something to luxuriate in. You don't get to have you know, the time to get it absolutely right. That was good enough. And I was like, no, but I was a little bit sharp on that second something or other. So I was amused that efficiency was valued so highly as opposed to perfection. <laughs> there is something weird to the music about it. And I don't know if it, like you said, like if it is the, the, the melody over the chords or if it's the specific tone of your voice or what, but there's something slightly off that I can never quite place. And I'm not really a music theory guy. I think it's the timing in that one, right? It's not a standard 4-4 four, four meter. I could yeah, the, the, the meter is, is odd and the yeah. um, melody has, what is it? Is it like an augmented something or other. So do you remember what you thought of the finished product of Fingertips? I absolutely loved it. I thought it was great. Um, I was really into miniatures in in music. Um, my hmm. ideal song length for, for anything is about 45 seconds. <laughs> if you can't do it in 45 seconds what's the point? You mm -hmm. know? Um, and, and a lot of my songs on my album from a millennia ago are, are fairly short, like a, around a minute. So I thought an eight second song or an 11 second song, perfect. That, uh, so I was very pleased that they did that. It's interesting what you said about the, the brief songs, because as a whole, Fingertips is like four minutes, five minutes, but because it's made up of these 20 separate little things. It goes by like so fast. It's like the fastest five minute mm -hmm. song I've ever heard, you know, cause I'm also similar. Like I, I don't have a lot of patience for a pop song that goes past like three, four minutes with fingertips. It's like really weird how it plays with time. I, I do wonder if there's some, I don't know, like deeper ideas to like the way time passes in it and the way like their, their philosophies about short songs kind of taken almost like to an ex like a grotesque extreme. I always imagined, and, and this is not necessarily, you know, corroborated by conversations with them, but I just imagined they had so much music that they wanted to do and so many snippets lying around that they thought, why not, you know, who needs to finish the song? You get the idea. <laughs> yeah. And it was just a brilliant way to to sort of, you know, like throw away these brilliant little gems. I think that's the bulk of the They Might Be Giants part, unless there's yeah. any other uh, interactions with them, you know, uh, after that point. Yeah, I don't think there's, there's much, you know, artistic interaction with them. I mean, the, the sort of larger circle of people um, like Brian Dewan, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sang uh, on some songs with my husband Brian Woodbury and uh, Kurt Hoffman is a buddy of ours from the Ordinaires. That collective of people, one wonderful, wonderful people. And then we moved away from Williamsburg. We had babies. We moved to Park Slope, and we kind of just lost touch with John and John over the years. And um, so. You know, I haven't really kept up with them. Mm -hmm. uh, we we keep up with with you know some of those folks, but not so much with John and John, which is too bad. I should <laughs> say hi. Fingertips too. Yeah, fingertips yeah, exactly. too. <laughs> Do you listen to the new albums, or have you seen them live much? We took the kids to see them. Oh wow! At UCLA Royce Hall back in like I don't know in the mid nineties mm -hmm. when my daughter was probably 11 ish, 10 ish. And my son was, was young and annoyed. And, and he was like, <laughs> I want to go home. This is too loud. <laughs> Reminds me of someone. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we saw them briefly then just outside said, hi, I think that was the last time we've seen them. And, yeah. and you know, I don't keep up. Uh, I, I keep up occasionally with the music. So now uh, I would love to talk about your, your, your big album, The Green Shade, 
which I've listened to many times this week. And I have to say, I, I really, really love track one. Uh, and I don't mean that to sound like I, only, I stopped at track one because I, I listened to the whole thing many times. There's something about that. So, and it's the title track. So like there's clearly like a significance there. But that's like a really beautiful, complex, interesting song with all these different parts. And the harmonies are fantastic. And it's it has the thing that I love in music, which is like you know, like the five senses, like in the lyrics and the, and even in the sound of it, like, so you get a full, like visual, virtual reality experience. And there's something about that song that like has that. And you got all the colors and all the stuff like that. I'd love to hear about how that album came to be. And I'd love to hear about that song specifically. It's actually cool in the shade, actually almost cold in the shade, but the sun some yards away is hot, but the sun is millions of miles away. Sweatshirt is at home. The green shade, the green, green shade, the green sweatshirt, the green, green shade. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and that was a, a, a great uh, description of the song. That was a, a, a really nice <laughs> piece of music criticism there. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, basically, I just, uh, when we were living in New York, I just missed the hell out of California. And we actually, the, the title of the song is The Green Shade, and we had green blinds in our apartment, our Park Slope apartment, <laughs> windows looking out right on, uh, you know, the World Trade Center was in the distance. And I just use that to juxtapose with the feeling of the light in Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area um, when you get under those sort of California live oak trees and the shade is green. So that juxtaposition of New York and San Francisco, Oakland really, the Oakland yeah. Hills, the Berkeley Hills. In addition... Uh, it's a very classical music rooted song. It's rooted mm -hmm. in Schubert Leader. And uh, that was a big inspiration for me was the songs of Franz Schubert. And so the piano arrangement is basically my version of a Schubert song. Wow. And there's a little bit of Steve Reich in there too, a little bit of, uh, I mean, at least that was my inspiration. I don't know if it came across. Um, <laughs> Hopefully I hit it well enough so that it doesn't look like I'm stealing anything because I don't think mm. I literally stole anything, but you never know. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, how did how did the whole album come to be as a, I mean, the, these songs kind of piled up over the years? Exactly, yeah, the songs piled up. The later songs on the album were written earlier mm. back when I was in San Diego, uh, some of them when I was in music school. And then the earlier songs, the 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 earlier songs on the album were written in like around 1984 uh, when we lived in Venice, California. And uh, I remember recording them on a Commodore 64 computer. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. Uh, recording those songs before I had kids back when I had time and freedom and um, and we were, you know, playing in our band, some Philharmonic, we were sort of gigging in LA and uh, the Bay Area. But I, I don't think that the album actually got finished until we moved to New York. Yeah, obviously, because it was mm -hmm. in the in the years that we lived in New York. So yeah, it's it's it sounds great, too. Where, where did you record that the, the album? Like, because it, it's it's produced really because your, your music's very like unique and everything, but you know, it makes it all, it sounds like the album makes it all make sense in a way because it's so well produced. Well, thank you. I've got you fooled because I thought it was pretty crappily produced, but oh, that's really? okay. Yeah. <laughs> I always think everything is better than my own stuff. That's like my thing. Like someone could play me something they made in like their garage and I'll be like, how did you do that? Like, that's just always what I'm like. I always think my own stuff sounds like, clearly bad and everyone else's sounds amazing well i thought it sounded pretty clearly good also so yeah, i don't think it's I, just you yeah i listened i listened all sorts so of places two people i listened on <laughs> my least. surround Excellent. sound system in the living room i yeah, listened very on my lush. computer i listened in then the car full. today yeah it's, it, it held up everywhere that i heard it so that's a good mix when it holds or mastering whatever when it holds up in all these different places which yeah. is what i always try to do with mine and it's like impossible <laughs> it was recorded all over the place some of it was recorded up in oakland all 
all in, you know, in the bedroom, basically, or the living room. Wow. And, wow. Um, I can't believe that. <laughs> but then we, uh, we mixed it and, uh, in the bedroom that was designated as the music studio uh, in, when we were in Park Slope, Brooklyn. So, so Brian helped me mix it. Um, mm-hmm. So it wouldn't it it wouldn't have probably seen the light of day unless Brian helped produce and and mix and and get it mastered and stuff. I I would have just let it sit in the can probably. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> The glue ones that keep popping up. It honestly kind of reminds me of fingertips Mm. and it kind of reminds me of please pass the milk, please, because it's got the same, it's almost the same tempo. It's like the bouncy rhythm and you know like the the very i mean milk and glue are not even that different looking so i don't know so um what what was the impetus for having that appear so many times on one album like a kind of a variations on an on an idea and do do you think there was a subconscious fingertips influence because it really reminded me of the milk the milk one specifically that's funny because it was written before that it was written sort of in the in the late 80s um didn't get record part of them got recorded then but didn't get finished until um you know just before the release so Mm -hmm. i don't remember this the sequence of when they were started but i think probably 84 485 is when I started wow. those. And I wanted to do variations and I just kept coming up with more ideas and I would I would kind of finish one and then okay, let's do this next one that has a different <laughs> tempo and and is about sort of a a different set of things and it's it's basically, you know, the the concept is basically about um science and sex. Um, and, and, and how, how you can talk about sex scientifically and poetically at the same time. So Mm -hmm. it's about like attraction Mm. and, you know, I, I heard the term molecular glue. I can't remember when early, Mm -hmm. early, early eighties or late seventies. And I thought, wow, that's a weird concept. And without really knowing what it was or doing any research into it, because that was before Google. (laughs) Um, You'd have to go to the library to look it up, and I wasn't going to do that. So that's just the (laughs) sort of the impetus for it. And the first one throws in a bunch of, like, um, stuff that I learned in high school physics about vectors and spins, (laughs) and so it has a bunch of sort of spiral imagery. And Mm -hmm. then... The other ones, I, I I don't even remember what they are right now. So. One of them mentions Velcro and Velcro, you know, right, right, right. <laughs> which so is th- similar. Things to- that stick together, basically. And it's got a kind of, the first one has a kind of, it's almost like a beat poet rhythm to it. Like, like there's something about it that seems like very beat poetry to me, but I don't know if if that was part of the recipe for it or not. That's interesting. No, I didn't, I I, I wouldn't have considered that, but that makes sense. I could like picture someone singing that in like a coffee house, you know, with like one person on like a drum or something behind them. I don't, just has that that feel for it to me. And that there's something interesting about the idea because when when a song keeps re- showing up on the same album m- multiple times and it, it's almost just like you get the sense whether it's true or not you get the sense that the songwriter like can't shake this idea for whatever reason mm. and it adds a bit of like a, an almost an obsessive feel to it and i, I really like that because like you know I, I i feel like i've had those things where i just can't stop thinking about an idea and I almost wish on on albums I could put like do the same song a few times, you know. You can, you, you can, can do yeah, that. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Do 
you think that was a little bit of the classical influence too? Not that I don't know too much about classical, but I know there's always variations on themes, or like there'll be like you know sonata number four, or five, yeah, that's sweet. and there's some kind of a I forgot the name of it, um, a theme that runs through. There's a musical term for it. Oh, Mot- you motifs. know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you think that came from the classical upbringing Absolutely. as well? Absolutely. I mean, I, I yeah. can't. Uh, nailed it. I can't <laughs> not do that. Yes, thank you. Nailed it. Um, <laughs> so out. those classical, you know, motivic thinking musically is is, you know, how my brain works. Yeah, mm. yeah. And it's also sort of um, like German expressionist films kind of come to sure. come into play, and like Kurt Weil and. Um, the old Kurt Weil, not the new one. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> the original. Mm. Is there any other, um, before we move on, is, is there an, any other songs on the album you want to talk about? Those were the, the few that I, I really, that stuck with me. No pun intended, because it's the glue one. <laughs> but um, I yeah. wanted to know about Jew at a at Oh, Christmas. yeah. <laughs> right. Um, we both relate to that. Uh, <laughs> um <laughs> I, I love that title. I, it's it's been a long running theme. What what was your inspiration for that song, or is it self explanatory? <laughs> it's self explanatory if you can decode the all the stuff. Um, you know, I'm a Eastern European Jew. I grew up in Southern California amongst blonde surfers who are now <laughs> a lot of them surf Nazis um, <laughs> down in Huntington Beach. <laughs> yeah. So I always felt like, you know, the outsider. Mm-hmm. And this song sort of grew out of that sense of, okay, here I am at another Christmas party and <laughs> um, let yeah. me make it really dense lyrically so nobody can understand what the heck I'm saying because <laughs> this is what my life is like, you know. You know, the, when you say everybody went nuts, everybody went cuckoo, everybody sang cuckoo, I was thinking when I am at my girlfriend's family's Christmas party, and, you know, I'm Jewish and Dave's Jewish, there everyone seems crazy to me. <laughs> yes. Because um, my family's, you know... Hebrew Jewish parties and stuff, Passover, all these things over the my childhood were were not they're somber events. Yeah, they weren't full of Usually. a bunch of <laughs> wackiness really. And yes. when I'm at my girlfriend's um family's house and her mom is running around going, like, let's sing Christmas carols, let's sing Christmas carols. And I'm just like, I kind of go in the other room or I go to the bathroom. <laughs> It's like I, I related to the, the song as much as I can uh, figure out of it. I, you know, I, I feel like it made a lot of it made a certain instinctual sense to me when I, I, I looked at those lyrics. <laughs> I'm glad. And the everybody sang cuckoo part uh, <laughs> references summer is a coming in loudly sing cuckoo, oh, um, okay. which oh. is like one of those old English songs, uh, mm-hmm. old Anglo-Saxon songs. So, yeah, there's all these references. Uh, there's a lot of biblical references right, yeah. as mm. well um, to, um, you know, talking about the Jews in Babylon and, uh, you know, the diaspora and, mm-hmm. and all that stuff. So, basically, I just threw in whatever references I could muster <laughs> that popped into my head and and strung them together in a way that attempted to make sense of them. <laughs> I, that's, I that's my method. Now yeah, you know. that's great. It's kind of not, it's not dissimilar to like what they might be Giants right. lyrics do a lot. And, you know, it's usually a collage of reference. The, the main reason our podcast turned into a show where I, cut to other audio clips is because I was trying to explain the references, <laughs> to, you know, and and I was like, well, let's just play the clip of the references. So, if, you know, if they, they reference an Elvis song, I play the clip of the Elvis song. And right. then that kind of spiraled out of control into now we're interviewing people and playing clips of the interview. And, all, you know, it's... I would love to talk about some Philharmonic because that's another 
uh, album you sent us that I, I listened to a lot. But I would love to hear what, what's the origin of this band? Yeah, um, we were Brian Woodbury and I were music students at UC San Diego, and and I kind of had a crush on him, or I was kind of <laughs> like a, attracted to him. So I asked him to be in a band because what else are you going to do? You know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think I had only been in like one, one and a half bands before that. Um, and he, he had been in several, um, several projects. And so we started writing some songs. The, the first song we wrote together was called House, uh, which is also on the Sun Philharmonic album, which is yeah. a, a, a version of House of the Rising Sun. It's a, you know, Looney Tunes, what, what is the Warped <laughs> Melodies thing version of House of the Rising Sun? There is... Yeah, that was great. I, I like that one. My girlfriend, her, she perked up when she was walking by when I was playing it. And she was like, is this House of the Rising Sun? I was like, I think so. <laughs> yeah, because so many people did House of the Rising Sun, you know, in the, the, the hippie yeah. psychedelic bands in the, seven, in the 60s did it. And so I thought it was time to do it again in 1980 which is <laughs> when we did it. So how, how did this album come about, actually? We just had a bunch of songs. We decided to make an album. We, we were gigging in San Diego, uh, and there were, you know, we, we were gigging in the punk clubs, basically, because that was what there was. There was punk and there was new wave. <laughs> um, and and there, there was disco also, but we didn't, we didn't do that. So we ju we got a bunch of songs. We decided we were going to record. And then when we when we finally made the album, oh, a fun a fun story is uh, we sent it to one of our heroes, Van Dyke Parks. Oh, and, okay. Um, and we were living up in Oakland at the time. And one day the phone rings, and and I pick it up and I go, hello. Hi, this is Van Dyke Parks. Wow. I loved your album. And I'm like, who who is this really? You know. So wow. so that was That's really crazy. fun. And and the, the relationship continues to this day because Brian just wrote a song with Van Dyke Parks that's on wow. uh, his new album called uh, the song is called Lucy I'm Home and it's on Brian's uh, band camp. You can listen to it. Sure. So the song motherfucker <laughs> there's a kind of vocals that you're doing the harmonies and stuff it, it it's not too different from hey now everybody at, at one point right motherfucker We were listening to a lot of Parliament Funkadelic, um, yeah. and and Brian was really into that, and so and he he also played bass on it. So he thought, funky bass, let's let's do this song, uh, and and motherfucker was a word that you did not say lightly back in in 1980, 1981. I think it was mm. 1981 that he wrote it. So it was it it felt a lot scarier to do that song back then. Interesting. And I remember Brian saying to me, okay, Elma, now you're going to sing this sort of like, like, do you, do you know what rap rap music is? And I was like, no, I, I don't <laughs> wow. know what that is. And he goes, well, it's like this rhythmic, you know. So he was trying to explain rap music to me, and I had never heard it. And, and so my performance on that is my attempt to recreate rap without ever having heard it just based on Brian's description. <laughs>
That's great. So, yeah, who knows? That's how new music genres get created. That's right. <laughs> people think trying to do something, they, yeah, that's fantastic. That's, it's a crazy album, honestly. It's, it's like one of the craziest albums I've heard in a while. Excellent. That, so we fulfilled our purpose then. <laughs> yeah. We could talk about, I, I really enjoyed the songs you sent me that were, there were these old music videos on YouTube. So there was the Oranges uh, Get Wise, I thought was really good. Everything's New in the, in the Sun. But Everything's New in the Sun has some kind of relationship to They Might Be Giants. I think Brian borrowed some stuff from Flansburg or recorded part of it in his studio. I oh, vaguely wow. remember. Oh, that's, that's reason enough to <laughs> play a clip of it. <laughs> Don't care what you call it. Sticks and stones won't break it. Any call will take it. These are great songs, and they're really melodic and interesting, and they're funny, and they're uh, I, and I enjoyed the, I enjoyed the like music video aspect of it too. They're they're actually pretty elaborate for what they are. The oranges, yeah. um, I love that video, and yeah, yeah, we used to perform that song live, and it was a bear of a song to perform. Really, mm -hmm. really just hard. And I think John Feinberg plays drums on that, and he also played oh, wow. with They Might Be Giants. He he played yeah. a lot with, with uh, my husband Brian. So another sort of part of the whole circle is that the the little design proppy things mm -hmm. in that video were designed <laughs> by Megan Montague Cash, who lives or lived in the building that Linnell lived in, which was the old mortuary funeral home uh, <laughs> place. Um, uh, anyway, uh, so she was in that whole circle and friends with Brian Dewan and all that. So. Oh, wow. So what what is the the background on these songs? It's it's your your husband Brian and you're you're in these videos too and your voice is heard on them. The albums were Brian Woodbury and his Popular Music Group. Uh, uh -huh. That was the band that you know John Feinberg played drums on and I was I played keyboard and sang background vocals basically. So it was Brian's band. Yeah, a lot of those videos are on YouTube or Brian's website. Mm -hmm. Some of them are, are really fun videos. Yeah. <laughs> Another video that that I really like is uh, or a song that I really like from back then is Flavor Packet. That Flavor that's Packet. another <laughs> one that sort of sounds like they might be giants independently, you know. They, they yeah, yeah. arrived at these sounds independently. Stew girl, you left me here. I'm all fed up now. What am I supposed to do, girl? What's the sense of leaving? What's your pleasure? What you pleading? You're my main ingredient. You're in the recipe I'm reading. In the rain, it's falling down, down. Let me tell you, putting the beat in the bonnet, making the doctor go quack. You mentioned in your email you had a bunch of stuff. Uh, that was almost done. Yeah, and it's just sitting there, you know, rotting <laughs> in digital space. Um, yes. Eventually, I, I will get to it. That's what I said when my kids went off to college. My, my last <laughs> one went off to college like four years ago, and it's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Still, still not. Uh, but, if, but eventually, I will get some more music out there. Awesome. Is it along the same lines of your original album, or is it a new territory? No, it's kind of more. Uh, it's it's less avant-garde. Yeah, mm. it's it's my sort of second, more mature phase. It's not my late <laughs> phase, but it's my middle phase. <laughs> I don't know. We'll have to see. We'll have to see what happens. 
that's fantastic. This was amazing. Um, yeah, thanks I so much. I can't thank you enough. This was so fun. Yeah, I heard I heard one of your previous podcasts, and it was what you guys are doing is oh. fantastic. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank really you. Really interesting and stuff. And thank you for it. Is silly because it's such a short little song, but it, to they might be Giants fans. It is an iconic thing. Like, yeah, it's, it's very special. It's I mean, yeah. if if you look at the with context of us or you know like. I got into They Might Be Giants when I was 13 and I obsessively memorized every note on every album that was out at the time. And this was like 95. Please pass the milk, please. It's like, it's burned in my brain for my, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's so it's, it's, no, it's, it's, it's no. always a surreal thing to finally meet people and talk to them about it and learn the context behind it. But I've heard that six seconds of audio probably a thousand times. Yeah. It's, <laughs> so these are yeah. like, these are weirdly like big, big things for, for fans of the band. Well, thank you for doing this. It's, 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 you guys are doing beautiful work. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. The gray sea, the gray, gray sea, the gray rocks and the gray fog and the gray sagebrush, the gray gulls or the gray sea. The sparkling streets and the bright windows The gray dawn or the golden sunset